Hi and welcome to this very first episode of Bridge to China by HU Tech Bridge. My name is Jonathan and I'm part of the ELU network producing this podcast. Um, it is episode but also in all the following episodes we will inform you but also educate you about the startup landscape on the bridge between Europe and China by interviewing key stakeholders. In this episode today I'm going to talk with Sabine Young Schmidt and Iran Lee. Both are working for the Berlin Government Senate Department for Economics, Energy and Public Enterprises and they have an office in Europe but also in Beijing and with that we're going to focus and talk about the cultural differences and then going deeper into how the work of the Berlin Senate office in Beijing look like and how they help startups. Um, we're also going to focus on differences between Europe and Chinese startups and we'll close up with basically some experience insights from Zabine and Iran and yeah have fun listen to this very first episode. With that a very warm welcome from my side dear Zabine and Iran to the podcast show Bridge to China. Yeah thank you thank you. Yeah, nice. So I thought I'm starting with a personal question before we deep dive into basically your work and your China experiences. And therefore, my first question would be, as you were both living, you, Iran, in Europe, but you as well, Sabine, in China, what kind of funny or weird experiences, cultural experiences, have you made maybe in the first time you visited the other the other culture maybe Sabine you, you can start yeah like a very nice question for warming up and for me also to reflect on some years that I spent in China when I first got to China it was in 2005 and I can share with you one of the experiences I made there that was uh, for me quite funny because before I went to China I had language training and I thought I was basically equipped with a standard set of Chinese to get along. When I arrived, in fact, like one of the, the funny facts that I had to notice in Chinese restaurants was that some of the dishes had very, you know, like very kind of creative names. And I particularly remember some visits to restaurants where even though I had uh, the menu in front of my eyes, I had a dictionary. Back then we didn't have any electronic dictionaries, but you know, like big books I carried with me in order to watch up missing characters I couldn't, couldn't read yet. I brought that all to a restaurant in order to, to be able to order a dish that I wanted to eat. And then I was confronted with a situation that there was a dish on the map which was called like Mai Yi Shang Shu. Yeah. Mai Yi Shang Shu literally translates into ants that are climbing a tree. So how would you expect, what would you get yeah, if, if you are ordering ants that are climbing a tree? And that was uh, for me an experience quite funny that also went on for uh, quite some years to learn that, yeah, like the culture also expressed in, in uh, food culture is something very special in, in China. And to me, it uh, certainly appeared very weird. And in fact, like the dish did not contain any ants at all. But it was like noodles or some, some beef. Yeah, but it was a very weird and, and funny aspect of uh, getting in touch with uh, the food culture in China, which caught me like uh, completely <laughs> by surprise. <laughs> yeah, Ira, what were your funny experiences in uh, Germany? You spent a long time in Germany. <laughs> It's what a coincidence that actually I think my funny or weird experience in Germany, which I made, is also happened in a kind of restaurant or bar. And it is also quite at the beginning I come to Germany, it was 2002. And we Chinese students uh, go together to a bar in Passau. And um, one guy want to order a beer for us. We are eight. So, you know, China, we have this finger language. If you use your thumb and your index finger, it means eight, actually. And I think he has spoken to the waitress and used this finger language, and he wanted to order eight. And the waitress, I think it's maybe too loud. She hadn't understood his German, and she has seen these two fingers, and she looked as quite weird 
and uh, because we are a bunch of people and she go uh, has seen nothing gone and back with two glasses of uh, beer we are so <laughs> astonished and it, it was quite funny i think at that moment i think she maybe thought what's wrong with this chinese eight people just to order two uh, beer but you see that is all kind of misunderstanding in culture it all happens in such kind of details it's really interesting yeah very nice stories and i definitely can relate to both of them and what kind of impresses me all the time is that it feels so natural for oneself but so different from the other person from the other culture yeah so very nice stories and i guess there are many more that we could cover and then maybe now going to your experience you both are working for the berlin government the the department for economics energy and public enterprises and it's basically the first office from the berlin government which has a foreign presence in china so my question would be Why is it so important for the Berlin Senate to have like an an office in Beijing and why is it maybe the first one chosen by the Berlin Senate? Yeah, thanks Jonathan. Uh, very good questions uh, that trace back to the times when uh, the decision was made to open such an office. In China, the decision was basically made because over a number of years, Berlin has continuously experienced increasing interest in particularly four foreign markets. And among the, the biggest ones that also companies raised an interest in were the US and China. And by numbers, speaking by numbers, China has, like over the last years, uh, over the last five years, tripled in import numbers into China regarding their uh, trade volumes. Many more uh, such kind of economic aspects actually kind of paved ways for uh, opening such an office or for making it uh, necessary also in order to support particularly Berlin companies uh, doing any kind of business in China. That includes those that are still not in China. So those that have an interest in China approaching as a new market, expanding uh, their business in China uh, for those that are already there or for those that have other interests in China to, to do any business for what they need economic support. And the other direction is also quite interesting for Berlin, as you can tell by, by numbers, by visitors, for example, or also by economic influx that we have seen in a very growing capital region. And the Germany here is that the economic power, the economic development here, the capital region, has increased tremendously. As such, also uh, industries have uh, developed over the last, let's say, like 10 years quite intensively and as such attracted a lot of international businesses. Aside of traditional spots that have already been quite attractive for international investments, now Berlin is also on the scale. And uh, if I mean international investments, I do not only mean like small investments, but also bigger investments, greater companies show an interest in the capital region. And this is also something the office now covers to help Chinese investors to understand Berlin as an investment location. And therefore, the office is the first point of contact in China. In a nutshell, for Berlin, it makes sense for three different reasons. Uh, number one was to help enterprises network together, like between China and Berlin. Number two was to uh, promote economic exchange. And number three was uh, definitely also on the way, like into both directions uh, to help with consulting or like business advisory, give information, etc. That is the background of the office, yes. I can see it definitely makes sense as China, China's appearance on the world is growing and the same also applies for Berlin as an ecosystem for, for companies. Maybe a question to you, Iran. So when you're helping companies entering the Chinese market or vice versa, how does this look like on a daily basis? And maybe also speaking here of some, I think young people can always learn and young companies also learn from surprising experiences that you made or had during um, your time working for the Berlin, Berlin Senate in Beijing? Yes, sure. So actually, basically, networking promotion our daily business. These are the three key wordings to describe our daily works. 
So we visit uh, Berlin companies in China. We visit Chinese companies who have potential interest to Europe, to Berlin. Actually, I had a quite a, a surprising experience the last several days, which I do want to share here, because I had a talk, very interesting talk with a startup company, Gina AI, the co-founder of this uh, startup company. It has been built up through several Chinese who have, who have studied and worked in Germany, but they have built up um, AI company both in Beijing and in Berlin. And this AI company is very successful now, has been ranked in on the top 30 AI startups by Forbes. So I had visited his company and I have asked the question, so why you uh, build up your company both in Beijing and in Berlin? Um, so they will open the office also one in, in Shenzhen. Such kind of expansion you could not imagine that happened in by a startup. He told me that why they have a company a residence in Beijing is because they could near off their customers because Chinese companies have highly willingness to try new things, new technology. They are very brave in this area. But in Berlin, which is really surprised me, he told me because he could recruit very good talents with a very good price performance ratio. Because in my old thoughts, uh, China is cheap with manpower. I would think that, okay, he will hire engineers in China and maybe have good uh, business in Europe, but it's uh, on the contrary. He told me that not uh, that the Berlin talents is cheap, but with the same price, he could hire uh, much better talents in Berlin than in Beijing, because you know in Beijing the real estate price is already reached to a high level. How how whatever you paid the the salary, it could still you could still not really buy apartment. That's why he said that. But on the other side, is a very uh, attractive destination for international talents. A lot of engineers from India, from Israel. Would, like, would love to go to Berlin to work, which tells me a very uh, interesting plus point for Berlin to attract the Chinese companies, I think. It's also changed my image about Berlin. Yeah, it's interesting. And I can definitely see that Berlin is still this a sexy but poor city. Maybe that's also changing. But so it, when you're saying this, do you, do you see um, that there's a different kind of motivation from f Chinese startups going to Europe and European startups going to China? Or would you say it's still the same motivation of like going to another market, conquering another market? Or as you say, Iran, maybe it's not the market, but it's more like the, the, the employee that you can find in the different culture. So would you say there's a difference of motivation of Chinese and European startups? Yes, I think. I think the, the final target is uh, quite different. different. For the European um, startups, they want to go come to China is for the Chinese market. But for Chinese uh, startups, they want to go to, to Europe. It's not for the market. It's ma of course, the market is important to approve that they are a successful and good company so that they could uh, be successful on the quite a, a natural European market. But the final target is still Chinese market. They need, uh, they need to have this uh, technology and talents from Europe and to improve their own service, their own product at the end to get be more successful and survive on Chinese market because Chinese market is really big but also very tough. You need to be really the best to convince the customers, not only at the side of technology or price, but also image. If you be successful in Europe, you could also much more easier convince your Chinese customers. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference. You don't need to convince your customers in Europe, whether you are su successful in China or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah that's a very interesting thought and i haven't never thought about this so definitely interesting maybe sabina a question to you because as we all experienced this pandemic for the last two years i can imagine it was also hard for you working from europe like managing the chinese office and you both need to 
collaborate very closely together. So what kind of experiences have you made in the past wh when it comes with working remotely? And what kind of challenges you're going to take and you're going to improve your your work life also for the future? It's a question that I would have to answer on different or like from different perspectives. Uh, number one is certainly the technical perspective. The pandemic has shown gaps in digitalization more, I would say, in Germany than in China. I have made the experience that in China, people can very easily adapt to digital communication and digital communication tools, just uh, like from a very technical perspective, like easily installed software, easily use software, easily handle, etc. And I have made experiences that this is something that Germany portrayed quite some, some hurdles to not only companies, but also governments to install new software, to do it all, you know, like if in, in Germany you want to bring something new into a running system, you first have to assure that everything works perfectly if, before you will start to implement something. In China, it will be a bit the way around, like you would test and by trial and error, you would detect the, uh, the yeah, like the, the, the projects or the opportunities that work and uh, those that don't work, you would filter out and just uh, shift aside. So in Germany, this, this attitude towards uh, perfection, to be conforming with laws, uh, GDPR standards here, privacy issues, etc., has in uh, many ways like really yeah, slowed this digitalization or like this digital communication that is needed in times when you cannot meet physically. And uh, certainly our uh, work is um, to a big extent, like Iran's and my work uh, for the Berlin office is to a big extent depending on communication. Communication is very important to build up new networks, to help with consulting and to also to do the promotion. And communication not only requires some, yeah, you know, like exchange of words. Like you know, there is more than acoustics to it, right? And so this is another thing that, on a perhaps more social or psychological level, we have figured out that there is difficulties also to build up with people you have never met before, to get a feeling, particularly in situations where people need advisory on sensitive topics. Yeah, to yeah, like catch the atmosphere or like to to, to be able to build a good relationship with somebody you have never met before and uh, this is definitely something on a uh, on a more social or psychological level i'd say is quite difficult however like to sum it up talking about communication tools itself like i believe the, the pandemic and this is what i would rate rather positively has given a, a big push to international communication. It has hindered international visits, but it has like it has really like accelerated international communication. What you just mentioned that the pandemic accelerated the international communication is I think definitely true and definitely a benefit of this so bad pandemic. But maybe another question, a follow-up question on this, because I do think that as you said, it accelerated the communication. However, Personally, I experienced that there are many borders still on the tools that we're using. So, for example, as someone who's used to Google Cloud, to the ecosystem like Slack, LinkedIn, it's still very hard to find a common ground when it comes to the communication with people in China. So what do you maybe, how are you handling this personally? But also, like, what do you advise companies and people who are interested in China, how they should handle their they tools, but also they communi their communication. This brings up a very crucial point in international communication, particularly with China. If you look in countries that are not completely connected for whatever kind of reasons, if that is for security or for whatever, any other reason connected to the World Wide Web freely then you run into problems like uh, just like walking to a wall where you can't climb over the wall definitely is something i would describe or like it's, it's commonly referred to the great uh, firewall of china china has a very closed internet would not necessarily go with the, with the term intranet but the more it develops the more actually chinese applications chinese softwares chinese portals for internet communication have replayed 
least international formats. So for Google search engines, certainly we have an equivalent in, in China, which is uh, not only one, but there's uh, more than just Baidu, for example. We have uh, for the communication tools, we don't uh, have anything that uh, works uh, very smoothly like WhatsApp. It goes up and down. Sometimes you can use it, sometimes not. Or Facebook is banned in China. You cannot access Facebook. So to China has replaced that or like build its own products for that. So if you want to relate to people in China, you need to go, you know, like do as the Romans do, do as the Chinese do. So in, in that case, you would have to adapt to uh, the technologies China offers. And that relates also to LinkedIn now and to uh, several other very commonly used software tools, uh, particularly for communication. So in terms of the pandemics, now we're traveling is really like, it's, it's not completely impossible, but it's encountered by so many obstacles that it's not realistic for a lot of companies to actually for building up new business connections traveling to China. This is a uh, really hard times and there is uh, no uh, clear solution to it, but to search local partners in China that can help you to do kind of your business and your interests. That means that if you want to uh, approach new customers, new whatsoever in China, you, you definitely need to reach out to people there. A very classic approach for a lot of uh, business enterprises to visit trade shows. Trade shows have been uh, switched uh, mostly to virtual formats. And uh, you can imagine how a virtual trade show looks like. It's, it's rather like a show that you, you just watch passively in front of the screen. So in order to really like get to the point to build up new connections, this is something or to, to reach out to people like uh, in a cold calling, you know, like setting up a contact list in order to, to broaden your, your databases of clients, for example, or to find uh, suppliers, whatever. This is something that uh, we don't have any solution for yet, except for reaching out through personal contacts. And these personal contacts could, or like to somebody who works on your behalf, in your interest in China for you and bridges this gap. That could be like, for example, like the Chambers of Commerce. The German Chamber of Commerce is a very active representing German company interests in China. So is the European Chamber of Commerce, very active. Our office certainly offers this service for Berlin companies solely, but maybe one or another person is listening, not only from Berlin, so yeah, like people can use these uh, channels to reach out to uh, Chinese markets, but the direct approach, the very approach a company would usually do without involving a whole environment before they uh, approach a new market is really slowed down a lot at the moment. Okay. Now I have a personal question and again to you because you know the European culture you know the Chinese culture by heart what do you think need Europeans learn about China when they want to interact on a good way with China okay actually it's a very difficult question for me um, as a humble Chinese actually we always think that we need to learn from other people from other cultures, specifically that China thinks that European culture, European civilization is much more advanced than China. So still, I mean, nowadays is opinion maybe has changed a little inside China, but still, I mean, I have still the opinion that uh, we should learn a lot from other side, not on the controversy. But if you say that, okay, European, I would say that maybe this kind of value what Europe always emphasize is right and it has also always been emphasized in China but we have other preconditions like this right we see it's also very uh, obvious in this pandemic what has it been impacted other people if you always emphasize I have this freedom and I have the, my right to decide what I want to leave. But uh, in China, we say, okay, you have your right, you have your freedom, but you still also have your duty and responsibility. That is always belong together. That's uh, what Chinese always emphasize so that we could not uh, enjoy our freedom or right for any moment, for any reason. We still need to 
obey the duty and to, to fulfill our responsibility. That's why in the whole pandemic, I mean, the Chinese people, the, the majority have always wear the masks. They have taken this rule, this regulation from government very seriously. It's not that they have been forced by the government. It's really the majority have the willingness to cooperate with the government. So I think that is a, a big difference between Chinese cultural value. I mean, the emphasis is different. Mm -hmm. In Europe, my emphasis one way, and in China, my emphasis another way. So I think the best way is that we, we know the bo both value is very important. <laughs> That's my opinion. Yeah. yeah, I would just agree what you said, because I think as a German person um, sitting here in Berlin that oftentimes we put our self higher than thinking about the others. And um, therefore, I think this is definitely something where we can learn more from China on the cultural level. Yeah. So we coming soon to an end. I would have like one last question that I want to address to both of you, um, dear Sabine and Juran. And that would be basically your three advices or insights um, that young people um, could take on and learn basically from you. So Sabine, in maybe three points, what do you think or what would you advise young people when interacting with China? I would not only defer and address this answer to young people, it will apply to all ages. I wouldn't make any difference between any any age. I would refer to three plus one C's, like ABC, right? C's. And number one is cooperation. Be open for cooperation. Certainly, China is a huge country. China has 1.41 billion people. Among them, many people are young, yeah, and many people are quite, yeah, like excited to newly jump onto employment markets, to also go to international settings to discover the world. That doesn't make any difference if you grow up in, in China or elsewhere. So cooperation is definitely something that you young people or people of all ages should keep in mind, certainly. And we all living on one planet as well. That requires, to some extent, some cooperation. Business cooperation is uh, possible. It requires a lot of preparation with China and the current conditions only make it more visible that this is not easy to, to do any, any business with partners in China. But it is um, possible and uh, therefore it requires a lot of curiosity. That is my second C, I would say. Uh, curiosity, keep curious. Be curious on how the world works elsewhere because uh, what we experience maybe even in a very internationalized. Berlin is not necessarily a standard for other countries. Maybe countries have different cultural backgrounds, developments, a different history. They have politically developed differently than perhaps this region here. I mean, definitely Berlin is a very special place in terms of politics, looking back at the history we had here in, before the wall came down, right? Yeah, like curiosity is uh, something that also makes, I believe, that makes life very rich. Be open for, yeah, not only for cooperation, but um, be curious to learn about the other, what, what is happening around you and allow to switch perspectives. And uh, number three, what we do today is um, do it by communication. So clearly um, communication in, in all aspects, like if you really want to go to China, try to uh, get to know the language, try to get a feeling on how people will communicate, not only in a business environment, but also how closely, I gave the example of the ants that are climbing the tree, you know, like how, how closely tradition is connected to communication, to culture, etc. And what the specialty in that is. And this is, again, something you can uh, discover by staying curious, and it will really enrich uh, a life, not only a life, but, but also your, your business experience, dealing with uh, partners in foreign countries. And number four, I would have to put that a little bit in breaks, because for many years, I only had three Cs, but the fourth C, I'd say, is uh, definitely also necessary. This is caution. Like, don't be naive, don't be blind, don't blind out any, any risks that uh, foreign 
market offers or bears, um, but do your homework before you try or before you approach a, a new market in any way. Like every big company would do so. They all have their internal departments for strategy uh, uh, building, for uh, risk assessments, like in particular with, with a country that does not share liberal values and as such like has set up quite some replacements for things, for institutions, for values that we know in, let's say, Central Europe. This is uh, something uh, people should keep in mind also when they do business. And it becomes more clear if we think about recent developments that we have um, seen from a European, but also from a Chinese level, um, when we talk about supply chains, when we talk about security laws, etc., this is clearly an uh, expression of more cautious approach to the other market. And so caution is uh, definitely a, a big spot also. And one of the four C's, then cooperation, curiosity, communication, and caution. Great. I, I like the four C's and definitely I will <laughs> be um, taking with them personally and always think about them. Um, very nice. <laughs> the four C's. Many thanks for, for these insights, dear Sabine. And maybe, Iran, what are your three insights that you would give to to everyone who wants to interact with China? Okay, I think uh, very important for the young people is always keep open-minded and uh, be respectful to other culture and other thoughts because uh, like Sabina said that we have different uh, history, different system. Nowadays maybe China has been positioned on the uh, upper side but still we, I think we need to make a difference between Chinese government and the Chinese people. That's two definitions and uh, Chinese people is actually a very lovely peaceful people I think and you should make your own experience in China and uh, you, I think he, before you make your um, opinion or the judgment on China, you should firstly learn Chinese. You could read and hear, understand Chinese, because nowadays on the media, what we receive about China is also not really sometimes the truth. I mean, truth is always in the middle. As long as you could not read Chinese, speak Chinese, I think the opinion you have built in your in your mind is maybe not really the truth. So I would only recommend that you please come to China to see China, to make your own experience and learn Chinese because a lot of actually foreigner I meet here in China, the could not really speak Chinese, read Chinese, which makes this understanding about Chinese culture very difficult because you, the information you get is always secondhand information and it has been filtered and it has been affected by other people's opinion and position. So that's what I want. It's like me, I have spent my uh, whole time, so more than 15 years in Germany. I have learned German and uh, I, so worked in Germany, so I can see, okay, I understand this land a little bit. I could even not say that I understand this, this, this country full. So I think it's very important to, to understand the language and to be in the country. And then you could say, okay, I like this country or not. The, so some people like me, I have spent my time more than 50 years in Germany. I could not, hardly say that I love or I hate this country. It's be part of me. So that's it. Thank you so much, Iran. And I think these are like all these insights that you just gave are very important. And I hope that our listeners will take them with them. And yeah, as you said, learning as much as you can about the Chinese culture and be always curious. I think that's very good. Yeah, with that, I could talk um, forever with you, but we're coming to an end. And I want to thank you about this wonderful conversation thank you very too. welcome thank you very much for this opportunity for this opportunity for this opportunity for this opportunity for 